You can read verses 4 through 9. Psalms chapter 34, verses 4 through 9. And uh, I want to say hello to my mother-in-law. She actually watches the, the videos, and I'm glad she's doing that. So far, she hasn't said anything, but <laughs> I mean negative. So I have one of those good mother-in-law that you can't, you can't make the jokes about it. So now it's public. She's heard it from me, so... <laughs> Okay, before I dig myself into a deeper hole, I'll get sidetracked here. Verse 4, Psalms chapter 34. I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto Him, they were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Our message this morning will come from verse 8 of Psalm 34 that we just read. And the title of our this morning's message is Taste and See that the Lord is Good. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the message. Lord, we pray, Father, that the words that go forth out of these lips, may they do their intended end, Lord God. You promise us that your word will go forth and it will not return void unto you, Lord God. I'm glad that these people are here this morning, Lord, and I pray, Father, that you meet their needs. If they need something from you, Lord God, give it to them, Lord God, according to your will. And I pray that the Holy Spirit touch our hearts this morning as we break the bread of life and as we receive nourishment from your throne above so that we can go another week, another day that we may learn to love you more and to serve you more and to appreciate what you've done in our lives. We pray you bless this message now. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm chapter, I'm going to give you a little bit of technical information regarding the psalm. We call this an acrostic psalm. What is an acrostic psalm? There are a few acrostic psalms in the Bible. An acrostic psalm is one where each verse begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. For example, verse 1 begins with the word with the, with the letter Aleph. Verse 2 with the letter Bet, 3 Gimel, and so forth and so on. You say, well, I still don't understand what an acrostic is. Well, we use this to help our children learn the alphabet. We say, A is for apple, B is for bear, C is for cake and so on. That's called an acrostic psalm. So as David is thinking about the goodness of God, he says, what can I write about God that begins with Aleph? What can I write about God that begins with the letter Bet? And then he goes so forth and so on. And David goes through every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, there's 22 ver verses in this chapter. And uh, some of you that are good at math will realize that there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. That's pretty simple. So that's the structure of the psalm. There are a total of seven acrostic psalms in the book of Psalms. So that's a little bit of the te technical information. I want to give you a little bit about, about the background of the psalm. David wrote this psalm when he flees from the presence of Saul as he is running for his life. And the thing that is hard to comprehend is when David flees from the presence of Saul, he runs into the land of the Philistines. And we know that the Philistines were sworn enemies with the Israelites, and they constantly fought with them. In fact, they fought over hundreds of years. In fact, I would probably say close to a thousand years in Israel's early history, they fought with the Philistines. Now, David was anointed to be king over the land of Israel, but he had not yet ascended to the throne because Saul was still king. David knew the strength and power of God because David himself testifies that the Lord delivered him from the paw of the bear, the mouth of the lion, and from the giant Goliath. Yet, in his distress, the Bible says he flees into the land of the Philistines, to a land where he had vowed to destroy. Remember, David was one of Saul's powerful warriors. The Bible says that he went out and he slew the Philistines by the thousands. But David, in his moment of weakness, returns to a land that is foreign to him, a land that is against what God had taught him as a child. And as I meditated upon that, I wondered and I said, isn't that the case with us? God has delivered us from this world and when we run into difficult times, 
when life, as I say, gives us its lumps, bumps, and mumps, we run back into the world, away from the arms of him who saved us, who delivered us from the very world that now we're running back into, a place where we escaped from. And during the time of Saul and David, we know from scripture that the cities, that the Philistines had divided themselves into five city-states, and they were Gath, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Ekron. And each city-state had a presiding lord over them, what we would call today a king. In fact, at that time, the city that David fled to was called Gath, and Achish was the king of Gath. I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 21 to connect this psalm with the actual story of David's life that caused him to pen this psalm. If we go to 1 Samuel chapter 21, I want to read verse 11 through 15. 1 Samuel chapter 21, 11 through 15, to give you the setting of the story here. Verse 11. Here's David, and he's fleeing Saul, and he ends up in the city of Gath. And the men of Achish, and the servants of Achish, verse 11, said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of mad men, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Realizing that his arrival was not welcomed and that evil was determined upon him, David feigns himself to be mad. He thought he'd be welcomed with open arms by King, a King of Gath, Achish, and by his servants, but the opposite was true. When he heard that they said David slain his, uh, Saul slain his thousands and David his ten thousands, he knew that evil was determined upon him. David became very fearful of his life. He flees from Saul. He seeks refuge in the land of the Philistines. They reject him. David has nowhere to turn to. And David does what he knows best. He turns to the only one he can turn to. And that is the Lord. At this moment, when David is between a rock and a hard place, he sits down and he thinks about God. And he pens this psalm. Psalm 34. David says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. What were the fears that David had? Saul, the king he had served for all his life, the king who had become his father-in-law, this king was now seeking his very life. He was chased from Saul, he was chased by the Philistines because they knew David, they knew how he fought in battle and how damaging it would have been to them. They even wrote a song about David and his victories. Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. By the way, eventually King Achish welcomes David. After David is fleeing for a number of years from Saul, Achish realizes that this guy is really an enemy of Saul. And Achish, being a wise king, knows that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In 1 Samuel 27, 12, Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people utterly to abhor him. Therefore he shall be my servant forever. David sojourned in the land of the Philistines, was one of the low points of his life. And this is a message for another time. But this time Achish did not accept David. So David flees. And where does David go? He goes into the cave of Adullam. We'll get there in, in a moment. And in verse 5 of Psalm 34, David says, They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. David said, When I had no place to go, when I didn't know what to do, when my back was up against the wall, I looked to God. And when I did, I was lightened. That is, my, my face began to shine. I was blessed by the presence of the Almighty. I want to ask you, what do you do when you are faced with the fears of life? I hate to be a pessimist this morning, but if you've lived long enough, you'll know that life will let you down. Whether it is health problems, financial problems, work problems, marriage problems, what to do with aging parents' problems, I'm getting calls from my dad in Greece and he's not doing so well. He's got uh, stage three, stage four cancer. 
and I'm just dreading the day when his wife will call me and say, hey, Dad, you need to come see your dad. We have the inner struggles. They will come. Job chapter 5, verse 7 says, Yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Troubles will come if you go long enough. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. The only refuge you have is God. because He's the only one that can succor you during these hard times. Someone said, if God will not calm your storm, he will get in the ship with you, and he will ride up the storm with you. It's worth repeating. If God will not come calm your storm, he will get in the ship and ride up the storm with you. There's no greater friend than Jesus Christ. And verse 6, I love verse 6 of Psalm 34. David says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. David is the poor man who cried. We know David as a man after God's own heart. And the distinction between King David and King Saul was this. That when Saul was confronted with his sin, he brought up excuses. He said, The people made me do it. When David was confronted with his sin, what did he do? He fell on his face and said, Lord, I have sinned. Please forgive me. David was truly poor in spirit. David was not perfect. In fact, if you examine the life of David, you will see in our eyes that the sins of David were more gross and more serious than the sins of Saul in our eyes. Saul, all Saul did was he sacrificed an animal before time. All Saul did was he did not destroy all but the king of the Amalekites. David committed adultery. David committed murder. David went against the Lord. There's a lot of things that David did, a lot more serious sins in our eyes, David did, than Saul did. But what was the difference? As soon as David was confronted with his sin, he fell on his face with a broken and contrite spirit, and he confessed his sin to God, and God forgave him. Whereas Saul, when he was confronted with his sin, the people made me do it. He made me do it. Like Adam, we studied this morning. It was the wife that you gave me. Passes the buck. Passes the blame. David was now alone. He couldn't show his face. He was a wanted man in his own nation. The Philistines didn't want him because he was their enemy too. The Bible says he escaped to the cave Adullam. I want you to turn with me. Hopefully you're in 1 Samuel chapter 21. I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 22 verse 1. They, David therefore departed thence from the land of the Philistines and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And something happened to this cave. The Bible says that David's brothers came. These were the same brothers that said to David when he went to see the battle, when Goliath was appearing himself before the land of Israel, before the army of Israel, they said to him, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. These same brothers that ridiculed David when he was a young man saw a life of faithful service and fearless leadership in battle. And now they were swayed. Now they knew that he was not the little runt. He was no ordinary runt. David was a man of God. And not only did his brothers come to him, but many who were discontented joined him and strengthened him. I want to read verse 2. I want you to look at it with me. Uh, same chapter, 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. Imagine this. David is in a cave alone, and he's praying to God, and he's saying, he's saying about himself that he's a poor man, and he cried unto the Lord. And what does the Lord do? The Lord sent his brothers, and the Lord sent some other people. Verse 2. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, they gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Here we have a picture of Christ. David, a type of Christ, gathers around him what we would call the dregs of society. In fact, it was God who sent them to David. And this is how David was helped. What others may call the undesirables, the throwaways, the deplorables. Those are the people that God sent to David. God gives us a perfect type of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, the Bible says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world 
to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Jesus says in Luke 5, 32, I came to call, not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. I am one of those people. You are one of those people. God gathered what we would call the low lowlifes of society because they're the ones that needed salvation. It was not the righteous that need salvation, Christ says. It was those that recognize that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. So David was helped by God. God brought all these people to be a help and an assistance to David. And when David saw all these people pouring out from the countries and the highways and the byways coming to him, David realized that they were sent by God himself. And in this moment of difficulty, as he saw those who were indebted, discontented, and distressed come to him, he realized the goodness of God. And at this moment of design, divine triumph, David says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is good. And as you study the scriptures, you'll find many attributes given to God. An attribute is a characteristic of God that, is, that explains and reveals who He is. And as you study the characteristics and attributes of God, you can label them in three levels. You have the primary, which is one, we'll get to that in a moment. You have the secondary attributes, and you have the tertiary attributes. The greatest attribute of God is His existence. In the Bible, He says, I am, and He stops right there. Elsewhere, He says, I am He, referring to His existence. And when you study the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God. God never makes an attempt in the entire Bible to describe his existence. He never says who he is or where he's from. He says, I am God. I don't mean he doesn't say who he is. He doesn't say where he comes from and his origins. This is the greatest attribute of our God. He is alive. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The first thing in believing God comes to believing that He is, that He exists. And then we have the secondary attributes of God, and I've only found three in the Scriptures. These are expressions uttered by God, and they are structured this way. God says, I am holy, I am merciful, I am gracious. And these are the second attributes of God. In Leviticus 11.44, God says, For I am holy, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 45, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Peter quotes this verse we just read in 1 Peter 1.16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12, God tells Jeremiah, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. And I will keep, not keep anger forever. In Exodus chapter 27, verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 27, God says, For that is his covering only, referring to a person who borrows a garment from a man. He said, It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep, and it shall come to pass, when he crieth unto me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. God says, I am holy, I am merciful, I am gracious. And then we come to the tertiary attributes of God. There are many, but I want to give you a few. The Lord says, the Lord is long-suffering, but he never says, I am long-suffering. Because the long-suffering of God has an end. God is love, but he's also a God of wrath. God is gentle, but he is also a man of war. God forgives, but he also punishes. But his mercy, grace, and holiness stand alone. They have no end. They have no countervailing attributes. God's love, God, God loves, God hates. God forgives, God punishes. But when God says, I am holy, I am merciful, I am gracious, there are no countervailing attributes. Now, I want to say this before I continue. I don't mean that any attributes of God are less important than others. All of God's attributes are important. 
And one of the things that God reveals about himself to Moses is Exodus 34. I want to read these two verses. This is, this is God bragging on himself. God can do that because he is God. He says to Moses, when he passed by him, he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And when you see and you read these verses, you'll find that one of the things that we want to focus on this morning is God says He is abundant in goodness and truth. God is good. David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. When it comes to food, we all have different tastes and preferences. Much of it has to do with how you were raised and what foods you've been exposed to as a child. Well, myself, I've been uh, in a Greek household. I enjoy feta cheese, olives, squid, octopus. Most of my children don't. Some people love sardines. Other like, other like lox, caviar, and oysters. I don't care for that. I don't like the taste of raw onion. I like garlic. My wife likes both. We all have different tastes. I remember one day when I was dating my wife, Annette, uh, I took her to our church's potluck. And uh, she was putting what she thought was potato salad on her plate. I knew it was mock crab salad, but I didn't say anything because I wanted her to taste it. She was one of those people that if it didn't look right, she wouldn't taste it. And I was watching her intently, and as she puts that, what she thought was potato salad in her mouth, she tasted it, she realized it wasn't potato salad. And I started laughing. I didn't tell her because <laughs> I wanted her to try it. She was the type of person to some extent that if she doesn't recognize something, she will not try it. And a lot of us are this way. If we don't recognize it, we won't put it in our mouth. I'm a little bit like that too. Many here this morning can relate to that. We all develop relationships with our food, a love and hate relationship. In fact, uh, Scientific America quoted one day and said, perhaps the most intimate relationship each of us will ever have is not with any fellow member of our human species. Instead, it is between our bodies and our food. We all have comfort foods. Funny, I talked to my wife, I said to her, when I'm sad, I eat. When I'm happy, I eat. When I'm bored, I eat. When I'm glad, I eat. When I'm celebrating, I eat. When I'm mourning, I eat. Everything I do, I eat. Kids call me snack dad. We all have this relationship with food. When I was a kid, I was a visual eater. If I saw herbs on my food, I would scrape them off. I wanted to see my food nice and clear. If I wanted to see a piece of chicken, I wanted to see a piece of chicken. When I fried an egg, I didn't want to have anything on it. I just wanted it to be white white as can be and I couldn't eat oranges when I was a kid because all the white veins all the pith veins around the oranges it just grossed me out seeing all those white things but one day when I didn't eat oranges till I was 16 years old one day my mom brought a big bag of oranges home and I saw that and a day or two later I got the munchies so I was brave I took one I peeled it meticulously I tasted it I said wow what a heavenly taste Later that day, my mom comes home and she opens the fridge and she says, where are the oranges? I ate them all in one sitting, all 16 of them. I had never tasted an orange until I was 16 years of age. All because the white stuff grossed me out around the orange. Many of you know what I'm talking about. I cringe what will happen to my boys when they all hit teenage, the teenage years at the same time. So what happened to me? I tasted and I saw that it was good. The oranges were there. I knew they were there. It wasn't until I took one, peeled it, and put it in my mouth that I could say, I tasted, and it was good. And Psalms 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. This is a verse of invitation to those who don't, do not fully know God. David is calling. He's inviting. Come and taste and see that God is good. If you're one of God's children, you will figure this out by the end of your life. That God is good. There's no telling what God will take you through. There's no telling what trials and tribulations He will bring in your life. But God does these things so you'll be able to say that the Lord is good. I see my dad now and he's suffering tremendously. He was a strong man. Uh, he was one of those uh, men that you wouldn't want to mess with. But now he's uh, almost 80 years of age. And I was talking to him on the phone. And he said, uh, I'm, not, I'm having a hard time walking. Chemo, the chemo, he's doing a lot of chemo treatments because of his age they cannot operate so they have to flood him with chemo and he's really weak and he says I can't walk 
I have to be careful that I don't fall. Everything that God allows, everything that God withholds, every affliction and every season, every stretching circumstance, God means it for good. God's disposition is one of kindness. His default action is for our benefit. God never does anything for our bad because He is good. His goodness is certainly is as certain as you can taste the savor of food in your mouth. God has given us five senses to taste the world around us. Taste means to intentionally put something into my mouth and feel the explosion of flavor on my taste buds and say that this is good. God uses things from our physical world so that we can understand things that are spiritual. And that's why David says, taste and see that God is good. We know the slogan, try it, you will like it. Advertisers use that when you go to Sam's Club, we go there to do our shopping in bulk because we have a pretty large family. You have all these little tables and you have these people putting out samples and I'm wondering and thinking, how do these people make money? All of these people coming in just at the right time when the samples are being handed out at Sam's Club. You can actually have a full meal sometimes if you go through all the tables. And after you're done, you're like, oh, I can't eat anymore. There's a reason why they do, they're not losing money because they know the chances are when you take a bite of that sample and you taste it, you'll say, oh, this is good. We were buying, we were tasting some crackers a few weeks ago. We could just put two boxes in our cart. We're not the only ones that do that. That's how they know they sell the product. Try, taste, and see that it is good. And if it passes the taste test, then we stuff our faces. Isn't that the case? <laughs> One of our fondest memories, and I still remember this as yesterday, is when we fed our first son green beans. We keep saying this story because it is so funny. We put the first spoonful in his mouth and the face he made was like we fed him lemons. So we said, let's take our camera and take a picture of this. We can't lose this moment. So then we, we put another spoonful in his mouth and he made the same face and he didn't disappoint. We were able to take that picture. We still, both my wife and I, still remember it like yesterday. The cry of many kids, Mom, this doesn't taste good. But what does the mother say? Eat it. It's good for you. That's what God says to us in life. Eat it. It's good for you. People, you hand them a gospel track and they say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't eat it. They do not want to taste that God is good. When Stephen preached to the Jews about Christ, the Bible says, when I heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. There's two reactions to the gospel. Either you will receive it and accept it, or your heart will get hard and you will gnash your teeth at the person who's giving you the gospel. They refused to taste the things of God. In their case, they saw the miracles. They saw the very Christ, God in the flesh, walk in their midst, yet they rejected it. Some people say, oh, I wish God would show me a sign. You still wouldn't believe if God showed you a sign. You have His Word. If you don't believe His Word, you're not going to believe a sign that it came from heaven. But David says, first you must taste, and then you must see that God is good. The psalmist is saying to everyone out there to try God out. It's an inner trial an experimental knowledge of God. Through experience of life, you will realize that God is good. Come by and sample and taste and see that your God is good. Taste that He is a rock. Taste and see that you can trust Him. He's a shield in trying of trouble. Trust Him when the enemy comes in like a flood for He is a high tower. What kind of person writes words like that? If you see most of the descriptions of God that David gives us in the book of Psalms, it is about someone who is defending against you in battle. A shield, a buckler, a bulwark, a high tower, a rock, a strength, a refuge, a covert, all military terms. Because God was in battle most of his life and he knew that he could lean on God. If you recall your Bible stories, you'll know that David was a boy shepherd and he protected his sheep. He had one eye on the sheep and one eye on the wolves who wanted lamb chops for dinner. David knew the goodness of God, how God helped him in the wilderness. But you cannot see the goodness of God unless you experience it and taste it for yourself. You can taste and you will see that the Lord is good. It is a sad reality that a lot of people are walking around in our society, in our world, without having tasted the goodness of God. And they don't want to taste the goodness of God. We were talking about Sunday school this morning and and we're the, one of the, the, the debates, the questions we have as human beings is, 
Why did God create us knowing that he, we were going to fall? Why did God make us all to want to believe in him? The reason why he didn't do that is because he didn't want to violate our free will. Just like you had a free will to believe in Christ the Savior, you have a free will to continue in the grace and knowledge of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can only know the reality of the goodness of God by experience. I don't know what God will take you through in life. I don't know what God will bring along your path, but God's going to do something if you allow him so that you can taste the goodness of God. There's a banquet at the Lord's table. The master has set out the best, the best food, the oxen, the fatlings, the vine ripened fruit, the best from the land, the delicacies that you can find. God is there. The feast is there. The table is there. God is saying, come and taste and eat. But the sweetness and the blessings of, on God's tables will be foreign to you unless you make it your own, unless you by faith go to the table of the master and eat. That's why in Revelation, Christ is knocking on the door of every Christian's heart. And he's saying, open the door. I want to come and I want to sup with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to have supper with you. I want to have dinner with you. I want to sit down and eat with you. The Bible says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Faith is a soul's taste. They who test the Lord by their confidence will always find him good. They will become blessed and they will never be disappointed. David also says, after you taste it and see the goodness of the Lord, then you will learn to trust Him and you will discover that the Lord can be trusted. The soul tastes truth like the lips taste food. Spiritual hunger cries out for rich, substantial nourishment. God can put a hunger in your soul this morning to want to taste Him. And that's my prayer of those who come to East Orlando Baptist Church. That God creates this hunger inside your soul for Him and Him alone. I remember back in high school, I had a, one of my best friends, he, was, he called himself an atheist. And I told him, you cannot be an atheist you can, because you cannot prove without a shadow of a doubt that God does not exist. You can call yourself an agnostic and saying that I do not recognize the existence of God, but you can't say emphatically that God does not exist because no one can prove it. They can turn to us and say, well, you cannot prove that God exists. Well, we know better, but for the sake of philosophical arguments, you can say, well, you may be right on that aspect, but you cannot prove that he doesn't exist either. So the, the debate goes both ways. So I said, I want to give you a challenge. Do you really want to find out if God is real? And he was sincere, and he said, yes, I do. I said, open up the pages of this book and start reading. And he started reading the Bible. And through reading the Bible, he come to believe that Jesus is the only way through God the Father. I remember one day he called me up and says, I did it. I did it. I knew exactly what he was saying. I realized that he had received a new birth. Through a reading of the scriptures, God the Holy Spirit have, have went into the deep recesses of his heart and showed him his need of a Savior. And he accepted Christ the Savior. That was one of the happiest days of my life, seeing my best friend come to Christ as Savior. In Psalms 119, 103, the Bible says, How sweet are thy words, and unto my mouth... How sweet are thy words unto my mouth, yea, sweeter than honey. But David says that the words of God are sweeter than honey. There's a verse, there's a story in the Bible when Jonathan, the son of King Saul, went out to a battle and defeated the Philistines. But his dad in his haste made a decree saying, No one can eat today until I be avenged of my enemies. But Jonathan was not there when Saul made the decree. And when Saul, when Jonathan and his men were going through the forest and they found some honey dripping from a, from a beehive on a tree, he dipped his staff and he ate that honey, not knowing what his dad had said. And when he ate that honey, the Bible says his lies, his eyes were enlightened. God gave us a story to tell us that you want your eyes enlightened, you want your knowledge to be grown in you, you want the knowledge of God, then read his word. Because his word is like honey. Just like Jonathan tasted that honey and he says, my eyes were enlightened. Likewise, your soul and your spirit would be enlightened the more you spend in this book, the more you spend time in the Word of God. When Jonathan tasted, he was able to see more clearly. I want to read some verses to you from Psalms 19 as we come to a close. Psalms 19, turn with me to Psalms 19. We're going to read verse 7 through 10. 
The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, than the honeycomb. Honey in the Bible is the type of the word of God. We just talked about the story about Jonathan tasting of the honey and having his, his, his eyes enlightened. It is through the word of God that your eyes will be opened. It is through the word of God that you will find the goodness of God. The verse says, Oh, taste and see. I want to remind you if you are here this morning and you have trusted Christ as your Savior, then you have tasted that God is good. Is anyone here that can say, I am a Christian, I'm a born-again Christian, I have regretted my decision? I would ask that. I wouldn't see one hand be raised this morning. In Christ, God has forgiven all your sins, past, present, and future. In Christ, God has given you a new name. In Christ, God has made you accepted in the beloved. There's a lot of times, a lot of young people roaming around our society, wanting acceptance. But they don't realize that in Christ, they will be accepted in the beloved. Your relationship with Christ, that's all you need to feel wanted. Because that's all we need, is to be wanted by our Father. And He does want us, but we have to experience that. In Christ, God has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. In Christ, God has made you part of the family of God. He has given you the power to become a son of God. In Christ, God has a home waiting for you in heaven. Christ God will one day give you a new body and as you're getting older as I'm getting older I'm looking more and more forward to the new body that God has for me on the other side of glory and Christ God will one day wipe away all your tears your hurts your disappointments your sorrows the more we read the words of God the more we read the promises of God we taste them and we realize how good God is it is only God words that can provide healing to our wounded souls and broken hearts the more we taste, the more we will see how true the words of the psalmist are. Taste and see that God is good. When your life goes south, when you're confused and you don't know where to turn to, your, best, your next meal is waiting for you in this book. But the words of God will be just what you need. So go ahead and try. His words are sweet. One of the things that I want to do in this church is I want, you to, I want to point you to two things. Not to me. Not to anyone else in here. I want to point you to this book and to your Savior. For he is the one who died for you. There's a hymn titled, I Have Been Blessed. I want to read a couple of stanzas to you. The hymn says, When he moves among us, all that he does, all of his mercy and all of his love, and the pen of the writer could write every day, even this world could never contain how I've been blessed. I have been blessed, God so good to me, Precious are the thoughts of you and me. No way I could count them. There's not enough time. So I'll just thank him for being so kind. God has been so good. I have been blessed. I hope this morning that you have listened to God's word and, you, and count your blessings. Name them one by one. God is good. If you have received Christ as Savior, God has given you the best gift you can ever receive. Someone once wrote, I have searched to find the meaning of life something to fill my empty soul. Some believe a lie, some choose darkness over life, but I will stand and let the whole, to let the whole world know I choose Jesus, the one who first chose me. I choose Jesus for now and eternity. And in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead, and in Christ is the fullness of God's goodness. Meditate on that this morning. Let's bow in prayer.